Hi, I'm Richard Blewett, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Mineral Seminar of Exploring for the Future's Virtual Roadshow. Now, Exploring for the Future is a $100 million four-year investment by the Australian Government to develop a prospectus for investment for minerals, energy and groundwater potential in Northern Australia and parts of South Australia. But before we get too far into the seminar, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Indigenous people who are watching us today. Geoscience Australia also recognises the traditional owners of the lands we've ac accessed across Northern Australia and recognise the help of many Aboriginal organisations and individuals who facilitated our surveys and ensured protection of cultural heritage. We would also like to acknowledge the many landholders, including pastoralists, industry, the many government agencies, communities who facilitated the land access for this really exciting new geoscience data to be acquired. We didn't do this alone. We had great partnerships with our state and Northern Territory counterparts, as well as other government funded entities. We partnered deeply with universities, great brains across Australia, and you see them listed here, as well as internationally, in terms of universities, as well as a couple of the geological surveys of Canada and the United States. So we thank them all. Minerals really matter. They matter to people, particularly people who are living in mining districts. Take Mount Isa. It's been around for nearly 100 years. This is an amazing ore, ore body. It's what we call a tier one mine. These are these intergenerational mines that give wealth to those regions, to those people. The thing is, these don't go on forever, and we need to have a pipeline of new mines like Mount Isa to ensure that this wealth continues for generations to come. These are going to be likely found in these vast plains, and you'll see this picture of the, of the road, the vast road out there, and what we can do to bring to bear to look underneath that cover to find the next Mount Isa or Broken Hill or Olympic Dam. Minerals really matter to people in their hip pocket. When we look at the latest statistics from the ABS on wages, we can see that the regions that have mines in them are the most affluent compared to those that don't have the mines. We can't see the inner cities. They're obviously the most wealthy places on, at the scale of this map. So mines, the point here is that the mines inject significant wealth into regional communities. So it's a key question for government. How can we sustain this wealth generation into the future? And that's part of our job, is to help ensure that. Minerals and resources overall matter enormously to Australia. A significant part of our GDP, our balance of trade and our export earnings, uh, $250 billion and trending towards nearly $300 billion this year. And right at the moment, in terms of dealing with COVID, the resources sector is still powering on and providing uh, wealth generation. So it's a really important part of our economy, no doubt about it. Employment, direct employment is around 250,000 people, but indirectly estimates are up to a million, more than a million people. And these are high paying, good jobs. So they're really important to all of us in Australia. But minerals matter to the globe, and we're all aware of the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. There are 17 of them. Minerals would factor in at least half of them. And I just want to focus on one of them, clean and affordable energy, sustainable goal seven. Because when we look at where we are trending in terms of trying to reach the two degrees limit or stay within the two degrees limit, we need to change our energy mix. We all know this. But we can't just do this with our old technology. We need new technology. And from that, we need new minerals. Not only the minerals in terms of quantity, but also of these different minerals across the periodic table, but the amounts of them. The World Bank has recently released a report around the amount of metal needed to keep us within the two degrees. And it's something like three billion tonnes of metal is going to need it to do that. Estimates around copper. Over the next 25 years, we're going to need to find as much copper as we've ever found in human history to meet this, this challenge. 
Now, a solar panel, a solar farm doesn't grow on trees. We have to find these metals to make these systems work if we're going to uh, have the life that we, we, we aspire to. Are we finding enough? The answer is no. Uh, this is a global compilation from Richard Shoddy from Minex Consulting, a recent con compilation last year, going back uh, a number of decades. And you can see the cyclical discovery rate. But the, ch the, the, the alarming part of this graph is over the last uh, decade or so, the decline in the quality ones, the tier ones, you probably can't even see them almost, they're so, so rare. And same for the tier twos. These are the, these are the big, big deposits that, that make a material difference. We are not finding these. We've found the easy ones, so what, what's the answer? Maybe Australia can help. Now, if we look at this map, this is a geological map of Australia with the mineral deposits that we're mining uh, shown on it. And you note that they tend to cluster in certain areas. And we can see the northwest minerals province of, of Queensland, the Mount Isa area, and you'll hear a lot about that uh, over the coming seminar. So we've got these clustered areas. They also locate where the rocks stick out of the ground, outcrop, okay? But we know from the mapping we do, we do that these rocks, these prospective rocks, continue under the vast plains. So much of this map, the, the sort of more washed out colours, the yellows and the greens, are covered. But we know that the geology, the prospective geology, extends underneath this. And I can show you a map that you will see again later. And this is a map of magnetics and gravity, so just two of the techniques that we use to image beneath those vast sand plains uh, between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa. Now those stars on the map are the mineral deposits that we know about. And you see they cluster in around those grey polygons. These are where you can go and kick a rock, the outcrop. Between those areas where all the colour is shown and texture is largely unknown. And so what we're doing here at Geoscience Australia is trying to lift that veil and map under that cover because that's what a lot of this country looks like. It's not obvious what's beneath our, our feet there. Now, fortunately, these giant deposits like Mount Isa, Olympic Dam, Broken Hill, Kalgoorlie and so on, have huge footprints. This is what we call a mineral system. So the deposit itself is a bit like a needle, a needle in a haystack, and this haystack is ginormous. It goes to the full thickness of the crust and even into the full thickness of the plate, right down to 200 kilometres, and you'll hear some really exciting science demonstrating this. That's a good thing. So what we can do here at Geoscience Australia is map the entire system. We're not here to find those individual prizes like Mount Isa, the needle, but to map the system. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the seminar. I'm going to hand over to Coral Chanota to take us through the next part of the seminar. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Richard. So that one of the key questions that we've been trying to focus on as part of the Exploring for the Future program is how do we find those haystacks, those regions of prospective rocks, the geology that lies under cover where new discoveries of minerals, energy and groundwater can be found. Well, to do that, we've acquired data sets, predominantly across Northern Australia, because that's been the focus of our program, but indeed some of them have been amenable to collection of data sets and processing of our legacy data sets across all of Australia. We would actually say that in our experience, we haven't seen this level and scale of data collection and diversity. It's unprecedented, but you can't do everything everywhere. You have to focus. So this map shows you where we have focused. It's actually a heat map of the areas covered by 62 contributions to the Exploring for the Future Extended Abstracts volume. This volume uh, is accessible from the uh, Exploring for the Future website, and you can see that there is a bullseye of focus between this region between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa. Why would we focus on that particular region? Well, it's a region that is ringed by world-class deposits. Yet, in the middle, it's full of cover, black soil plains, there's dunes. What lies beneath? We don't know. We didn't know when we started. But it's an area, it's a question that we wanted to open up because the greatest opportunities lie in those frontier regions. So how do we go about 
uh, this task of seeing what is down beneath and finding those juicy areas for exploration. Well, we've done this by this approach. The diagram actually summarises the main themes of that extended abstracts volume. And I'm going to take you through from right to left. So what we use is a systems framework in order to guide the mind, guide our investigations and assess regions for their prospectivity. The program has done it for groundwater, energy and minerals, but here we're going to focus on minerals specifically. But importantly, the various data sets that we collect link up across those different resource themes. So in order to be able to assess a region, you need to be able to map it. So while we use our understanding of how concentrations of minerals occur, that is the mineral system, we focus on characterising the entire plate. So classically, we've been focused on characterisation of things at the very surface or the near surface because that's where the deposits may sit. But we know that the deposits form as a result of a system which includes the entire plate and even what happens down in the mantle. So what you're going to hear in this series of talks is the characterisation of the layers of the Australian plate, all the way from the surface, then the basins, then the crust, and the lithospheric mantle itself. Now, that's going down to depths of over 200 kilometres. How has that anything to do with narrowing down the search space? Well, I hope you'll stay tuned. But in order to do that, what, you, what, what is fundamental is actually the engineering, the knowledge and the diligence that lies beneath that, and that's the toolbox area. It's an area that doesn't normally get that much um, focus in terms of what we say, and even here, we're going to be focusing on the final result, the so what. But there is a lot of effort in terms of how do we go collect the data sets? How do we control, uh, quality control them? How do we create them, store them, deliver them, process them, invert them, interpret them? That's a whole body of effort. We'll have a few touches on that, but it is one of GA's core responsibilities, and that is actually where a lot of our time goes, in order to ensure that the following conclusions that we make about the systems and where to explore next are robust and defensible. So, before we go in, and we present the various details from the top to the bottom of the Australian plate, I want to just focus on giving you a snapshot of the diversity of the type of data sets that we've collected, because it's amazing. So starting off at the surface, we normally talk about cover as being the sediments, but actually, in a lot of Australia, the vegetation itself is an impediment to be able to see what the rocks that, are, uh, that lie beneath are. So what we've done is we've actually used 30 years of satellite data to, in a sense, capture that snapshot in time when the vegetation may have been under stress during a drought. Maybe there's been a fire, but it exposes an opportunity to see the rocks and soils that lie beneath. You can then transform that to map various minerals. We've, uh, as with other colleagues in the project, we've mapped the topography in more detail than we've ever done before. And we've transformed our knowledge of the distribution of the topography to look at the various changes in, in landscapes so that we can then take uh, information from things like soil chemistry and apply machine learning to interpolate our knowledge in areas where we do not have samples. Going further down, basins. Now, that can be sources of, of deposits, but they are also the cover uh, for a lot of mineral exploration. So we've been focused on that core question of what, how thick is it? What is its distribution? And we've used unprecedented data sets to do this, like OSAEM, and you'll hear about them shortly. We've exploited things like the magnetic map of Australia to come up with targeted magnetic depths. We've partnered with our colleagues in energy to take hold of information from source rocks uh, across the country to look at prospectivity. And we've continued deep reflection seismic profiling to map the major crustal boundaries. So going into the crust, we know that geology is important and we know that we need to know what the geology is down at depth. But what is essential is to have a map and we haven't been armed with a national map of the geology that lies at depth. So that's something that we've started as part of this program and we'll be stripping off layer by layer. That's based on improved coverages of gravity and magnetics, sort of the crown jewels of our uh, geophysical data sets. And we've released new 
coverages of that as part of the program. And a really exciting component is the isotope atlas, which you will shortly hear about that characterises the crust. And going even deeper, we can map the boundary, the moho, the very top of the lithospheric mantle, or the lithosphere thinosphere boundary, the very base of the plate, and then characterising what is inside in terms of its conductivity and resistivity structure through programs such as OSLAMP and OSARAY. So now, without further ado, I want to hand over to Mary Ord Bonadot, who's going to take you through uh, insights specifically on the Tenon Creek to Mount Isa region uh, on surface and cover mapping. Thank you. All right. So to help explore more efficiently undercover, we have taken the challenge to map the cover at continental scale and in 3D. But as you can see on this map, and as Richard presented before, the cover that is presented in pale yellow colors extends on about 80% about of the surface. So it's a huge area to cover. And we cannot realistically only rely on field mapping and sampling. Instead, we need to develop a new approach. So in this talk, I will show you the steps that we took to go from this 2D geological map in North Australia to this 3D layered model. And I will show you how the enhancement of existing data, the acquisition and interpretation of new data, combined with new tools development, help us to predict what you can see under the cover. So let's start first with the geology. So you can extract more information from it using satellite imagery, such as Landsat and Sentinel, as Carol uh, talked before. But first, you need to remove the effect of, a, of the vegetation because it prevents us to map directly the soil and the exposed rocks. So to do this, we developed the bare earth model. It was produced from a time series analysis of Sentinel imagery that captured time of exposed soil. And this data set maps the variation of the surface mineralogy that gives us some indication of the rock lying under the soil. For example, here, the blue color indicates the silica-rich bedrocks or quartz sand. The green shows the distribution of iron oxides and the red color indicates the clays. So now let's go a bit deeper with the Airborne Electromagnetic Survey called OZM. This data shows the electrical conductivity variations of the subsurface that depends on the rock physical properties. This survey is the world's largest airborne electromagnetic survey flown to date. From east to west, it extends across 2,000 kilometers. And the phase one of that survey here, OZM1, is as big as France and Germany combined. This survey was acquired with a 20 kilometer line spacing and was supplemented with company data. So what can we really resolve with this data at this scale? The very first feature that you can see here is the resistive basement in dark blue and the more conductive sedimentary basins in warmer colors. Now, if you look a bit closer, you can also identify major faults, discrete conductors, possibly related to mineralization, or specific lithology, such as the black shells. Using infield data, you can start map at a higher resolution and, for example, refine the geometry of paleo valleys or map the variation of the water composition. So now, let's have a look at one line in more details. On this section, you can see lateral and depth variations of electrical conductivity. And because the flight lines were diverted to intersect borehole locations, we were able to correlate those variations with the stratigraphy from boreholes, but also from the surface geology. And the pink line here corresponds to the limit of your interpretation that goes down to 200 to 300 meters. So now, using this data integration approach, we conducted a first pass interpretation of the OZM1 survey. And given that we work at continental scale, we focus on mapping only the major age boundaries, such as the Cenozoic, base of Cenozoic, base of Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and so on. From this interpretation, we were able to reevaluate the sedimentary basin extent and identify some potential economic deposits. This interpretation was compiled in a new database, the estimate of geological and geophysical surfaces, eggs. 
X is the backbone of our cover modeling work. Uh, it allows us to store depth estimates from various data sets and make the data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. EGS is underpinned by other databases at GA, such as the Australian Stratigraphic Unit Database, which to make sure, to ensure that we store consistent information and we can keep track of the processing steps, but also the changes of interpretation. So as I mentioned before, we focus mainly on the major age boundaries, such as the base of Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and so on. And in eggs, uh, those boundaries are defined with an overlaying and underlaying units. So to date, we have over 200,000 uh, depth points stored in eggs that you can visualize using different attributes, such as the depth or the age boundaries. So now that we have this all new data set, how can we actually use it to build our cover model? So if you extract from eggs some depth estimates, for example, for the Mesozoic surface, you can simply start to grid those points using an interpolation algorithm. And you will get a good result where you have a high density of points. Now, if you assume that there is a correlation between those depth estimates and other geological and geophysical data sets, you can also use a machine learning approach such as uncover ML. In that case, you will need to use additional input data sets, such as the gravity, magnetics, or distance from outcrop, to generate your, your, surfa your predictive surface. Now, in, based on those two results, you can see that at regional scales, we, you have a very similar uh, predictive results. However, in the machine learning model, you can see that we have uh, more variations at smaller scale. So if you get very similar results uh, from those two approach, why are you using uh, the machine learning method? Well, first, you can enhance your model where, for example, uh, you have a sparse data distribution. But more importantly, if you use a probabilistic model, you can also predict the uncertainty associated with your surface. Uh, and in that example for here, the green colors indicate areas where the difference between your input data and the surface model is less than 10 meters. And in red, it shows you the dif a difference that is greater than 200 meters. So with UncoverML, we now have a new tool that allows us to model the cover in terms of geometry. But what about the cover composition? You can also use UncoverML uh, with geochemical data to predict geochemical backgrounds. In that case, you will need to adjust your input predictive data. And for example, you could use the bare earth or you could use the surface electrical conductivities to produce your model. And this is the example of the Northern Australia Geochemical Survey in which we use the bare earth model. In that survey, we discovered high concentration of copper in the same catchment or downstream as known mineral deposits. And those anomalies are as big as anomalies that we see in large copper mine in Mount Isa. With Uncover ML, uh, we were able to predict the geochemical backgrounds, and the results show that we saw some copper anomalies that are distributed along uh, individual drainage lines, which is a pattern that we also observed from geochemistry, um, sorry, from groundwater geochemistry. Now, to further characterize the cover composition, we completed a seamless solid geology dataset across North Australia. And based on over 200 quarter million scale map sheets, about 1,000 drill holes, and magnetic data, this work consists of peeling off the stratigraphic unit layer by layer to reveal the extent and nature of all the rocks. And at this scale, this data is a world first. It enables to predict the spatial distribution of stratigraphic unit that can be prospective for minerals, groundwater, or energy. And in some cases, it can expand exploration opportunities. Now, to conclude, from the enhancement, acquisition, and interpretation of data, combined with the development of new tools, we were able to streamline the cover modeling workflow and deliver a consistent and predictive cover model in depth and composition. 
This predictive mapping approach integrates multi-scales and multidisciplinary data sets to assess the resource potential at regional scale. For example, in that area, where only 10% of the prospective pre-neoproterozoic rocks outcrop, our model reveals that about 35% of these rocks lie under a cover that is less than 250 meters. So although this model will need to be refined as new data becomes available, it's a key data set to predict economic areas under cover. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ord. What we've seen is how do we map the depth of the economic search space and what lies immediately beneath it. Now, Catherine Wallerberg is going to tell us about how we can characterise what the crust that lies beneath uh, is like. Catherine? So, Marie Ord told us about the new layered solid geology maps, which show the subsurface geology of northern Australia in unprecedented detail. This is possible because we have a wide range of geophysical and geochemical coverages which and enhance our ability to image and interpret the crustal structure and composition. Today, I will outline some of those data sets and techniques and show how they inform our interpretation of the crust. Two of our most fundamental and familiar data sets are the national geophysical coverages of gravity on the left and magnetic intensity on the right. These are generated by stitching together thousands of individual surveys collected over decades and uh, settling them to a baseline that's consistent across Australia. GA releases new and improved versions of these products every several years, and these 2019 versions include seamless coverage from onshore to offshore for the first time. Active seismic reflection is another key technique for mapping geology undercover. It is typically collected along long traverses using vibro-sized trucks by sending seismic waves down into the crust and measuring the seismic signals that return uh, to understand geological boundaries and structures. The map on the left shows the coverage of seismic lines across Australia. The Exploring for the Future program has enabled us to collect a lot of new data uh, in key regions where none was previously available, which is marked by red ellipses on the map. We've collected more than 2,500 kilometres of new seismic lines during this program, making some of the, these the, some of the longest seismic surveys ever collected. The central map shows the location of the South Nicholson and Barclay seismic surveys, which cover the South Nicholson Basin up north into the Beetaloo Subbasin in Western Queensland and Northern Territory. On the right map, the Kidson Survey in Western Australia imaged the Canning and Yanina Basins and the underlying Rudal and East Pilbara terrains. This image shows part of the Kidson Seismic Survey, about 200 kilometres of the 870 kilometre total length of this survey. Uh, the depth of this is from the surface to 60 kilometres depth, so we're uh, imaging um, the entirety of the surface and down into the upper mantle. In this image, we can interpret uh, basins and structures near surface, which is important for any basin-hosted resource systems, and we can also image major faults and sutures, some of which penetrate into the mantle. We can also uh, clearly see the base of the crust, um, or the moho, particularly on the left side of this image. Passive seismic is another way to map geology undercover. Here, rather than using vibro-sized trucks, we deploy an array of sensitive seismometers shown in the top right map and left them recording for a year. The seismometers measure ambient noise generated by natural phenomena such as earthquakes, but also from heavy vehicles, wind and water. We turn these ambient noise signals into a map of seismic velocity for the rocks at depth. Seismic velocity varies from one rock type to another, so this ambient noise tomography map is a proxy for geological variation. Here is an example from the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa region at four different depth slices. In these images, warm colours show rocks with slow seismic velocities and the cooler colours show faster seismic velocities. These images are interesting, particularly the correlation between the east-northeast trending fast seismic velocities in the deepest slice at lower right and the location of major mineral deposits which are shown in pink. 
Mafic rocks typically display fast seismic velocities, so the blue zones if the blue zones correlate with mafic rocks at depth, there will be implications for mineralization, particularly copper, as we will hear in later talks. With broadband magnetotellurics, we're now mapping electrical conductivity through the crust, which maps crustal structures and tracks conductivity anomalies, in which some cases correspond to paleofluid flow pathways. This technique fills the gap between uh, AEM, which is near a surface, and the long period OSLAMP program, which images the deep crust and mantle. These three techniques together give us a complete conductivity through, from surface to the mantle. So here's an example of data we acquired in the East Tennant project area. On this map, the, on the left, the regional OSLAMP coverage is shown as the background colour stretch. In this study area, stations are set up, set up as traverses, as shown in the middle image, um, in white, and the geological structures are shown in black. The broadband MT data, which is shown in the two right-hand panels, sharpens up the regional OSLAMP data. The data can be viewed as depth slices, as per the middle image, but also cross-sections, as shown on the right. Uh, this will be um, talked about more in the iron oxide copper gold talk. So these geophysical uh, approaches tell us about the current state of our Earth, but we're interested in mineralizing processes that occurred millions or billions of years ago. So we need to consider this time dimension when we interpret these geophysical images. Geochronology and isotopic studies can give us this time dimension, helping us to understand when certain geological features formed and when particular mineral systems were active. To provide a comprehensive data set of this timing information, we've compiled all the available age and isotope data from northern Australia, and in some cases across all of Australia. Our uranium lead coverage on the left largely focuses on magmatic ages, but also includes all available metamorphic and maximum depositional ages. On the right, our argon coverage for northern Australia contains ages describing cooling, deformation, metamorphism and eruption events. We've also used gaps in these coverages to focus on our own new data collection programs. Similarly, we've put together isotopic data sets, measurements from crustal rocks which inform us about where they come from, how they got where they are now, and tell us more about how the Earth has changed through time. Samarium neodymium and lutetium hafnium isotopes tell us about crust forming and recycling processes. This is important because large scale ore deposits are often associated with major crust forming events. In simple terms, the map on the left and centre are maps of the age of the Australian crust from the time it was extracted from the Earth's mantle. Lead isotopes, shown on the map on the right, tell us about sources of mineralising fluids and the rocks these fluids have come from or interacted with on their path to the site of mineral deposits. Uh, and there will be much more on this in a subsequent talk about basin-hosted mineral systems. So these age and isotope maps from this slide and the previous one together comprise the isotopic atlas of Australia. Uh, and this is the first time we've had all these coverages together in consistent formats in one place. So in general, the geophysical techniques map proxies for the underlying geology. But we still need physical samples wherever possible to calibrate these proxies and to test our interpretations. Ultimately, we want to know about the geology which rocks and which properties are responsible for the remotely sent signals. The image on the left shows the legacy drill hole coverage for northern Australia, and we have accessed some of the pre-existing core to measure physical properties, geochemistry, including alteration characteristics, and ages to understand geology undercover. This includes a large geochronology campaign, as shown on the right map, where we've produced hundreds of new ages over the course of exploring for the future. Uh, this sampling program has given us many important new results. One example is geochronology in the East Tennant Creek region, uh, from the area shown by the red box on the map. Legacy drill holes have given us access to rock samples where the basement geology was previously unknown. We were able to date rocks from six drill holes, and not only did the results fill a gap in our spatial coverage, they also informed our mineral potential study in the region. This is a regional time-space plot. On the left is the geology of the mineralised Warramunga province as exposed near Tennant Creek. Uh, the timing of much of the mineralisation is shown as a yellow star on this left figure. 
The basement rocks to the east of here were very poorly known, but our new results in the centre panel constrain the maximum age of the host metasedimentary rocks and the timing of deformation and magmatism. These rocks are the same age as the exposed geology at Tennant Creek and preserve the same event chronology. So the ingredients for Tennant Creek style mineralisation are also present under cover hundreds of kilometres to the east. And you'll hear much more about this in a later talk. So uh, just to wrap up briefly, I've given a very brief glimpse of some of the methods we've used um, to understand the crust better. So that's it from me. Back to you, Carol. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing with us the characterisation of the crust and not only looking at its spatial distribution but also the evolution. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper and Mark is going to tell us how the murky world of the mantle may well have something to do with mineralisation. Marcus? As we move into the mantle, you might be wondering, what does this have to tell us about mineralisation processes at the surface? The imaging of the lithospheric mantle can deliver step changes to our understanding of mineral prospectivity. And it comes back to the framework provided by the mineral systems approach. I'm showing here an example that's been put forward for an iron oxide copper gold mineral system, but I'm using it a little bit more generally. What this cartoon illustrates is the point that Carroll was making earlier, that mineral systems models make predictions about lithospheric architecture. This can include features like the presence or influence of subducted slab material, large volumes of chemically altered or metasomatized mantle, often representing the source region from which our metals are mobilized, rapid transitions in the crustal or lithospheric thickness, and crustal scale fluid pathways, which provide connectivity from the mantle to the surface. Imaging these features of Australia's lithospheric mantle allow us to gain new insights into the mineral systems responsible for the deposits that we see at surface, and then to use these insights to inform our understanding of mineral prospectivity. As an example of these methods, I'm going to give you an overview of two ambitious national scale data collection programs that Geoscience Australia is leading to geophysically image the architecture of Australia's lithospheric mantle. OzLamp on the left and OzArray on the right both represent the union of Geoscience Australia, the State and Territory Geological Surveys, OzScope and Academia under a common banner to collect magnetotelluric and passive seismic data across the continent on a half degree grid. The OzLamp program deploys long period magnetotelluric sensors. The program is already well established in the southern states and through exploring for the future, we have been able to expand deployment into the north as well. Using magnetotelluric sensors, we are able to progressively image the broad scale electrical conductivity structure of the crust and the upper mantle. This is well suited to imaging the signatures of metasomatized mantle and of the alteration associated with fluid flow pathways. Hence, there is a particular relevance to mineral systems with strong magmatic components. You'll see an example for iron oxide copper gold deposits, but it will also be true for orogenic gold or for nickel, for instance. As we zoom into this region in Northern Australia, we see an example of Auslamp imaging the mantle resistivity structure. This is a depth slice taken at about 60 kilometers within our model. The resistivity profile has been overlaid by the magnetic field to give you a sense of the crustal fabric, by the outcropping pre-neoproterozoic geology, and by known iron oxide copper gold deposits. What we see is that in the outcropping and shallowly buried rocks around Cloncurry, Queensland, IOCG deposits are associated with a strong conductivity anomaly. Around Tennant Creek in Northern Territory, deposits are also associated with a weaker conductivity anomaly. 
that begins to trend northeast as a conductive corridor uh, across to Burketown. And what we're potentially seeing here is an extension to the mantle alteration associated with the Tennant Creek system. As Catherine flagged in the Crustle talk, we can compare these results to those of a broadband magnetotelluric survey conducted against a series of faults over this conductive corridor. And the deep-seated mantle anomaly resolves into a series of fine-scale conductive structures that follow the major faults in the area. Mantle metasomatism and connectivity with surface. This will be brought together more strongly in the mineral systems talks that follow. But from the mantle perspective, what we're seeing is that imaging the lithospheric mantle helps to define that regional context to undertake the scale reduction in the search space for minerals uh, exploration. We switch now to Osiray, through which we are deploying broadband seismometers across Australia. This sort of passive seismic imaging of the Australian continent began in the early 1990s through the Australian National University and has continued largely within academia. Through exploring for the future, we have been able to double the rate of national data collection, as well as to pull this huge volume of legacy data into a standardised and quality controlled uh, national data coverage. Passive seismic waveform data is relatively cheap to collect. It is also information rich and there are a range of imaging techniques that can be used to map the subsurface velocity structure. Catherine showed you the ambient noise tomography that is being used to map crustal structure. And here I show how we are using receiver function analysis to gain a greater insight into the nature of the MOHO. The MOHO is a discontinuity in the velocity structure and represents a transition into the mantle. Deviations in this service may indicate the presence of crustal scale fault systems. And our imaging of these is particularly important where the surface expressions of these systems may be obscured by sedimentary cover. The MOHO map on the left is a combination of estimates from seismic refraction, reflection, receiver functions, uh, tomographic models, and autocorrelation studies. We see that there is a general correlation between major base metal deposits and the flanks of thick crustal blocks. Our ability to draw these inferences is only made possible because of our new data collections. The Osiray deployment provides uh, continuous coverage and methodological consistency, creating the framework for regional MOHO mapping. Our deep crustal seismic reflection profiles also allow us to add in the fine scale MOHO structure. As a result of exploring for the future, our understanding of the MOHO in Northern Australia has changed considerably. The dis difference map on the right subtracts our new MOHO surface from that produced without our new data collections. And it shows that broad regions of the MOHO surface are on the order of 20% shallower than had previously been thought, while we can also see a lot more fine scale structure than could previously be resolved. We can take this new information and synthesize it into new knowledge about the mineral prospectivity of the region. So far, I've discussed our national scale data collection programs and how these contribute to our imaging of the lithospheric mantle. But I suggested to you earlier that imaging of the lithospheric mantle has the potential to deliver, to deliver step changes in our understanding of Australia's mineral prospectivity. To get a flavor for this, I'll give you a quick overview of our work to map the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary or the LAB. The LAB is a thermal boundary and marks a transition in heat transport from the conductive lithosphere to the convective asthenosphere. This figure shows the modelled LAB beneath Australia. 
and it has been produced by integrating regional seismic tomography with xenoliths. Xenoliths are rock samples that have been exhumed from the deep, and we can use their geochemistry to estimate the depths and temperatures that they have experienced. The inferred geothermal trends, shown here as a thick black line, help to calibrate the transition of seismic velocities to temperatures, as shown by the thin green line. Sufficient xenolith samples are available in nine locations across Australia, and these are but two examples. But by integrating the geophysical and geochemical data together, we can build these robust imaging techniques. But what of it? Why is that important? Well, when we plot Australia's known sedimentary hosted base metal deposits over this map, a remarkable relationship emerges. These deposits are found along modern day crotonic margins. And this holds irrespective of the deposit age, even though these deposits date back over one and a half billion years. This relationship doesn't just hold in Australia, and Dave will show you shortly that it can be observed globally. There are mechanistic reasons for this to do with rates of basin formation and thermal controls on geochemical processes. But the salient point here is that the lithospheric scale footprint of this mineral system provides a first order control on the localization of deposition at surface. Identifying this relationship has forced us to revise our understanding of these mineral systems. And Dave will shortly tell you about how this has influenced our appraisal of mineral prospectivity. So please, have a look at the products that we're developing to image Australia's lithospheric mantle and think about how they might influence the mineral systems that you're interested in. Well, thank you, Marcus. Uh, that concludes our section on looking at the characterization of the Australian plate, all the way from the surface down to its base. Now we're moving into a different part of these presentations, which focuses on how do we integrate the pieces of information that we have in order to develop a more holistic understanding of mineral systems. So the next talk is going to focus on new insights into sediment-hosted base metal mineral systems, and it's going to be given by David Houston. Thank you, David. OK, thank you, Carl. This, this, today, I'd like to actually talk about some work that we've been doing over the last four years, looking at the distribution of basin-hosted lead zinc and also copper deposits in northern Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the work of a lot of people um, you'll see them in, later on in, in the acknowledgement list that Corral will send at the end. But we'll move on to, to the talk. So this is the model that we had um, prior to um, this project started. And it's, it's a fairly simple-minded schematic model where you have the deposits forming between two sort of different styles of crust. Okay? To the left, you have continental crust. And to the right, you have uh, oceanic crust, or now we'd probably put it as extended continental crust. The important thing is that these two types of crust have quite different characteristics in a number of ways. The other important thing is that we predicted from this model that there should be a change in the depth of the lithosphere, because as you're extending, you actually will stretch the lithosphere. And so I'm going to actually show you evidence that we can actually map these criteria using a number of different uh, data sets. So we'll move on to the first one. Well, before we move on to the first one, we'll talk about why the zinc belt in, in, in northern Australia. Well, first of all, it's because it's in northern Australia. It's within the, our area of interest. But more importantly, it's, one of, it's the largest zinc belt in the whole world. It has 100, about 100 million tons of endowed zinc, 69 million tons of endowed copper, and uh, uh, of endowed lead, and in fact, 9.9 .9 million tons of endowed copper. So it's actually a very large uh, system. In fact, total uh, lead in this district is about 25% of the amount of lead in the world. 
If you look at the diagram, you'll see a number of dots. I uh, draw your attention to the light blue dots, and these are mineral deposits which look like HYC um, in the Northern Territory. Now, it turns out that these things plot on a north, northwest to northwest trends with about a spacing of about 130 kilometers. And you can see that looking at the blue line that I've, I've just put up on the diagram. This trend cuts across the known geological um, features and also the geophysical features. So you can actually see that. You look at the, at the trend of the geology on this diagram, and it cross-cuts it. So what's, what's controlling this trend? Okay, the first indications of what's controlling this came, trend came from geophysical data, gravity data. The diagram that you see is an upward continued gravity image at about 30 kilometers depth, and we've had some discussions about what this is before. And you will see that deposits are actually strongly associated with a gradient within this image, let's say for where you go from yellows to reds. There's actually a, gra a gravity gradient. And you also not only see this in the 30 kilometer upward continued, but you also see it in the 15 kilometer, 50 kilometer, and 100 kilometer upward continued images. So there's something fundamentally different between one side and the other side of that deposit trend. It's interesting that Bruce Hobbs found that there's a strong relationship of these deposits with what are called gravity worms. And the gravity worms are actually just reflecting the boundaries that you see in the upward continued gravity data. So we have a major boundary that we can see, or a major gradient that we can see from the geophysical data. Now we're going to move on to a totally different set of data. And this is lead isotope data. Okay? And what we have calculated is something called mu, which is the uranium to lead ratio. And as you can see, there's some quite interesting trends on that diagram. Again, you have a stark, a, a very sharp contrast between stuff to the uh, west and stuff to the east. And lo and behold, the deposits sit on that trend. And you can see that there's a bit of complexity in, in, in the data, which might relate to existing structures. So there's some relationship between this trend and the, stru the local structures and the deposits themselves. And again, we have that same line that we saw before. Now we're going to move on to a totally different data set. And this is the lithospheric asthenospheric boundary uh, data set, which I believe Marcus and, and Catherine have talked about before. And so this just shows you the range in that uh, lithosphere thickness. And you can see that the deposits are actually along the boundary between the blues and the whites and the reds, OK? And again, we show the same boundary. The deposits are, sh are sitting on that same trend that we saw before. So we actually have three different data sets which are telling us the same thing, which is quite important. If you had one data set, you might not believe it. If you have two, certain sound good. You got three, it's, it's pretty much very well established. So we've got three different data sets telling us the same thing, and three quite different sorts of data sets telling the same thing. But not only do we see that in North, North Australia, we also see it around the world. And this is a diagram of the LAB across the world. And again, blue shows thicker um, lithosphere, and red shows thinner lithosphere. And as you can see from this diagram, most of the lead zinc deposits around the world and a lot of the copper sediment hosted copper deposits are plot on this lithospheric asthenospheric gradient at about 170 uh, kilometers depth. We also see the same thing in lead isotope data. And this is from north, north um, Western America or Northwestern North America. And we see that the deposits which are shown in the blues are actually along the gradient between high mu and low mu. And in fact, if you look at the detail, the deposits themselves are actually associated with complexity in that gradient. I, you see a lot of little zones within it, and that suggests it's related to local basins. The other thing is that you see on that the 170 kilometer um, thickness gradient of the um, LAB, 
And you can see there's also an association with that. So we see, again, globally, this relationship between these, these different data sets. Now I'm going to move on after this. And it's just to show you what we've done is we think we can now map the zones where these deposits form, the lead zinc de deposits and also the copper deposits. Now I'm going to move on to the next part of my talk where I'm going to talk about metal sources. And this diagram shows you the concentration of, of zinc versus concentration of potassium for mafic volcanics from within the basal part of the North Australian Basin system. And you can see that there's some trends here. You see one trend shown in red of decreasing uh, zinc with potassium enrichment. And you see another trend in the blue where you have depletion with potassium loss. So you have zinc leaching associated with potassium addition, but also potassium loss. Now if we go to the copper, which is shown in the next diagram, in this case we've looked at it against magnesium to indicate chloritic alteration, and you can see there's two things there. So the blues, which indicate uh, your younger volcanics, in general there's a copper depletion. So there's a general copper depletion from what you would expect, which is shown in the green box. If you go to the Siegel volcanics, the older volcanics, you actually see a strong relationship, a correlation of copper depletion with chloritic alteration, i.e. increase in magnesium content. So there is evidence of significant metal depletion within these systems. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. And so we'll look at the uh, magnesium potassium um, diagrams here for the older volcanics and also the younger volcanics. And just going through that quickly, we find that you have potassium um, alteration, K feldspar alteration associated with zinc loss in both systems. You have chlorite K feldspar alteration um, in both systems, and it's not associated with metal enrichment or depletion. And then you have chloritic alteration in the Siegel volcanics, which is associated with zinc and copper loss. If we look at the distribution of these uh, relationships, and the diagram that you see here shows the location of samples that we've, we've taken. The diagram over on the um, right shows you the distribution of potassium, the average distribution of potassium in, in, in the samples that we've taken. And you can see there's some significant patterns. And they're actually related to geology. Okay, so you have K feldspar alteration shown in the purple and chloritic alteration and K-feldspar chloride alteration shown in the greens and yellows. It turns out that the older volcanics, i.e. the Eastern Creek and Siegel volcanics are associated quite strongly with the chloritic alteration, whereas the younger volcanics are more strongly associated with the potassium alteration. Now we're actually going to take that diagram and look at it in more detail. And so we're going to look at this area through here, which includes HYC. And if you do that, and you take that area, you can calculate a surface area of about 46,000 square kilometers. And if you make a couple of assumptions in terms of thickness and metal loss, you can actually come up with a fairly robust estimate of the amount of zinc that has been lost from these rocks. And that's about 1,600 million tons of zinc. And that is significantly greater than the 130 million, 113 million tons of total endowment. So there's no problems in getting the zinc. But the really interesting thing is you can do the same sorts of calculations for copper. And then you look at the, the, the copper endowment and you ask where's all the copper gone. So there might be copper potential in these systems which is unrealized. Now we're going to actually look to see if we can actually map this alteration. Okay, so this is a diagram looking at magnetic susceptibility versus magnesium. And you can see from that, you have chloritic alteration demagnetizes the rocks. But it also strips out the metal. So you can actually maybe map metal depletion zones using magnetic information. 
And just to illustrate that, we're going to go back to the same area, and we're going to zoom in. And this is a diagram showing the total uh, RTP magnetic field and the location of that sample. And you can see from that that the map distribution of the Siegel volcanics, as shown in the, in the very heavy dark black line, there's significant variations in the um, magnetic response. And that might be because of this alteration that we've documented in the holes which are shown in the big blue dot. The last thing I'm going to talk about is taking this information that we've got and actually move it to look at mineral potential analysis. And the diagram you see on the left indicates the uh, LAB contours overprinted by the, dis the location of mineral deposits. And you can see from that that there's a very strong relationship between mineral deposits, sediment hosted mineral deposits, and the LAB. We can actually do more with that and we can start looking at some of the features of, of the host rocks of, of the mineralization and then we can start excluding areas from the, the potential areas defined by the LAB. And therefore we can start to move on to error reduction beyond the LAB and I think that's the, the way that we're going to go in the future. And we can also identify frontier regions. Okay, we can actually I think we can also use um, the gravity data to identify frontier regions too. So, in conclusion, it appears that sediment hosted lead zinc and copper deposits are controlled by edges and we can map them in three different ways. The data sets define a first order exploration vector. The metal sources in these deposits appear to have come from mafic volcanics located at depth in the host basins. The magnetic data make be used to define leached metal sources. And the initial studies indicate that the basin scale stratigraphic data might be used to define further exploration pathways. And then finally, we'll have to bring in the data that we've already got, along with other data, including structure, stratigraphic facies, uh, and timing, to come up with a, uh, a better and, and improved uh, mineral potential assessment. Thank you. Thank you, David. What remarkable insights you've provided in terms of the spatial distribution of sediment-hosted systems. And we're in a much better place now to be able to work out where to go to find the next giants. What we've heard is a lot of those insights were fairly large in scale. Yet the pointy end of exploration is how do we transition through the scales to get into that CAM scale uh, prospectivity. And the next talk by Anthony Schofield and Andy Clark is going to focus precisely on that problem in that region between Tennant Creek and Man Isa that we've been focusing on. And it's going to particularly focus on new insights into iron oxide copper gold mineralisation in that region. Thank you, Anthony. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Carol. Uh, I want to begin with this map, which should be quite familiar to you all by now. We've seen it a number of times. But this shows the surface geology for the region between Ten Creek and Mount Isa. And again, the darker colours on this map represent areas of older prospective basement rocks, while the paler colours represent more younger cover sequences. And also shown on this map with the stars are deposits which have either gold or plus or minus copper. And you can see a very close spatial correlation between those stars and the older outcropping basement rocks. But one thing I want you to note from this map is the area in the middle. That's the black hole that Carol was talking about earlier where we have no known deposits. And that's because of the more recent cover sequences which obscure the basement in this region. And because of that, it's an area that's seen very little exploration. So the question we have in this region is how can we identify new prospective fairways? Or to put it as Richard stated earlier, how do we identify where the haystacks are in this vast undercover region? Now to answer this, we need to understand a few things. We need to know what are the important geological features to identify, what data sets we can use to map them, and what are the tools we can use to reduce the scale from this very large scale right down to an area that an uh, explorer can target. The mineral systems concept gives us an approach for how we can begin to answer these questions. Using this framework, we can identify important ore forming processes which operate at the very large scale 
and identify mappable proxies we can use to map these. This diagram here shows one particular formulation of the mineral system. Uh, so it has four key components to it. It has energy to drive the mineral system, favourable architecture for fluid migration, sources and depositional sites and gradients. Now, there's a couple of important things to note about this. One is that there's a scale component going all the way from the very largest scales right down to a very, very fine scale. And the other one is a time component. And that's very important because what we need is for these uh, important metallogenic ingredients to come together in both space and time. Now, we can relate diagrams like these to uh, conceptual mineral systems models, such as this one for iron oxide copper gold mineral systems. Uh, which we're particularly interested in mapping in the Tenter Creek to Mount Isa area. And using these kind of uh, models, we can identify what the important ingredients are that we need to be able to map out. So for the case of iron oxide copper gold mineral systems, the kind of things we need to be able to map are the footprints of tectonic and thermal events which drive the system, deep tapping faults and sutures, fertile source regions, iron oxide alteration and redox gradients, and large scale fluid flow uh, leaching and alteration. So over the next few slides, we're going to have a look at how the data sets which have been acquired in the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa region as part of exploring for the future can be used to map out these key uh, mineral system processes. So the first component of the mineral system we're going to look at is favourable architecture, which provides the pathways for the transports of metals right from their source regions up to the depositional sites in the near surface. So this map here shows faults which have been interpreted from magnetics and gravity data in the Ten Creek to Mount Isa area. And what we can see is uh, a number of faults which have strike lengths of several hundred kilometres. So we know that these are important regional structures. However, using the magnetics and gravity data alone, we're unable to provide insights into the nature of these structures. And at this point, we're only imaging relatively shallow levels in the Earth's lithosphere. Passive seismic data sets give us additional insights into the scale and significance of these structures. So this map here shows the seismic velocity at the 10 to 12 kilometre depth slice, which Catherine showed earlier. And there's lots of uh, information in this map, but what I want you to notice are the east-northeast trending bands, which correspond closely to the faults we mapped in the earlier slide. These data show that the faults imaged in the surface in magnetics and gravity data are actually expressions of larger, more fundamental architecture in the mid to upper crust. We can go even deeper, though, with the passive seismic data down into the very murky depths of the mantle to the base of the tectonic plate. So the contours shown here represent the depth to the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, which uh, Marcus showed earlier and that Dave also used. Again, there's a lot going on here. But what I want you to notice is this major gradient that we have in this area where we have uh, 40 kilometres of vertical offset along 150 kilometres of lateral distance. So this is actually quite a very steep uh, gradient. Again, note the very close spatial correlation between all of the data sets we've been looking at so far. If we put all of these lines of evidence together, what the picture that we have emerging is of a major structural corridor that's lithospheric in scale, so all the way from the base of the plate right up to the very surface. And this is the first time that this structural corridor has been recognised. And it's the kind of favourable architecture which we know is important for localising the locations of large mineral deposits globally. So using this data, we're really starting to zero in on the location of our potential haystack. Another of the deep imaging data sets acquired in the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa region as part of exploring for the future is Auslamp Long Period Magnetolurics data. Now this data measures the deep electrical resistivity structure of the Earth's crust and mantle. So the map that we're looking at here is a 35 kilometre depth slice through the electrical resistivity structure. So um, even though we're talking about resistivity, conductive areas are shown in the warmer colours. And we've overlain the data sets that we were looking at previously on top of them. I want to draw your attention to this northeast trending corridor of elevated electrical conductivity, which occurs east of Tennant Creek. Uh, you'll note uh, from comparing it with the other data sets that it corresponds very, very closely to the structural corridor which we identified previously. So we're now looking even deeper at the 60 kilometre depth slice in the model. So we've transitioned from the crust down into the mantle now. And there's a very similar picture emerging. However, instead of just imaging the architecture of the region, what we're starting to show is compositional variation within the mantle. 
And what this may rep represent, as Marcus flagged earlier, is relatively more fertile source regions where the mantle has been metasomatized or chemically altered or juiced up, uh, like I like to say. And these zones are more favorable for the formation of large ore deposits. Now the mineral system components we've been looking at so far are operating at quite large scales. Right at the other end of the scale are ore, ore depositional sites and gradients. Now it goes without saying that for I IOCG deposits, you need the IO. So where are the iron oxides? This map shows areas of interpreted iron oxide alteration which have been derived from 3D geophysical inversion of magnetics and gravity data. And you can see from this map areas where we've modelled uh, interpreted magnetite-rich alteration and interpreted hematite-rich alteration. And some, uh, hopefully many, of these rep may represent the footprints of hydrothermal alteration associated with mineralisation. Uh, significantly, what you can also see from this map are areas where you have those two distinct iron oxide types adjacent to one another. And this represent, represents an important chemical gradient where you can deposit metals out of hydrothermal solutions. So let's take stock of where we've gotten to so far. Using these different layers of evidence, we've been able to identify a broad prospective fairway which we have termed the East Tenant Fairway. Now we can arrive at this simply by overlaying the different evidence layers we've been looking at and seeing where they correlate spatially, which is shown in the map in the left-hand side there. Or we can undertake semi-quantitative mineral system analysis using an algorithm to combine the different ingredients that we've been talking about to show where the most prospective areas are spatially, which is shown on the map of the right there. Now, depending on which, which approach we use, they both show a very similar picture. So we have a lot of confidence that this is a prospective fairway in the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa area. But there are still a number of unknowns. For example, how can we reduce this search space to only the most prospective parts of this belt? How do we connect the deep fuzzy features we've been looking at with something in the near surface that an explorer can reach with a drill rig? And finally, do all these ingredients come together in time and in space to potentially form an odd ore deposit? So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Andy Clark, who's going to take up these questions and show how they've been addressed in the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa area. Thank you, Anthony. So here you can see a pseudo 3D image of the Tennant to Mount Isa conductivity model from OzLamp data at 35 kilometres depth. And you can see the conductivity anomaly extending east-northeast from Tennant Creek as well as some of the interpreted major uh, faults and shear zones which overlie this conductivity anomaly near the surface, which, we, uh, which Anthony mentioned earlier. This next data set in the middle of the screen is a higher resolution conductivity model of broadband magnetotelluric data that Catherine and Marcus mentioned earlier. We collected this data to investigate the larger conductivity anomaly in more detail and to see whether it continued up to the Earth's surface. As you can see as we zoom in, the model from the broadband magnetotelluric data resolves the deeper conductivity anomaly in the bottom right corner. It also shows that anomalous conductivity at depth continues up towards several discrete conductors near the surface. This is pretty exciting because similar conductivity architecture exists below iron oxide copper gold deposits elsewhere. Like the fingers of God image of Olympic Dam that some of you might be familiar with, this image from the Ernest Henry mine also shows conductive anomalies extending from the lower crust up to the surface directly below uh, copper gold mineralisation. And many workers interpret these conductors as fossilised pathways where metals have been transported from deeper source regions up to the surface. So these conductivity models not only demonstrate significant potential for iron oxide copper gold mineralisation in the East Tenant region, but they also highlight the utility of broadband magnetotellurics as a powerful scale reduction tool for mineral exploration. Next, we'll zoom into the area shown by this red box to look at one of the near surface conductors in more detail. As you can see, conductivity is not well resolved by our magnetotelluric survey at this scale. However, overlaying airborne electromagnetic data from the AusAM survey, which also shows conductivity from this exact location, albeit at a different colour stretch, we can see a significant conductivity anomaly at a depth of around 200 metres, coincident with the top of the conductor modelled from magnetotelluric data. 
This demonstrates the utility of airborne electromagnetics as an exploration tool in this region. We've shown here how it images one of the many tips of a massive electrical conductivity anomaly that extends more than 80 kilometres below the Barclay Tablelands way down into the mantle. Interestingly, this conductivity anomaly is intersected by one of very few um, historical drill cores from basement in this region. What's more, this drill core, shown in this image, contains rocks that are highly deformed and altered. The red and grey colours reflect iron oxide alterations similar to other iron oxide copper gold deposits, which is pretty spectacular to find su um, above such an extensive conductivity anomaly in a completely covered greenfields area of Australia. And I'll note that this drill hole was drilled to hit a mag high interpreted to be a kimberlite, uh, which it wasn't. So going back to the surface geology of the region, we can see just how far from prospective outcrop this drill core was taken from, over 150 kilometres east of Tennant Creek. In this next map, we've removed the cover geology and left on the older rocks that are the right age to host the main phase of copper gold mineralisation at Tennant Creek. The background magnetics image largely reflects these older rocks, which we now know continue beneath the younger sediments in the centre of the image. Prior to the Exploring for the Future program, any insight into these buried basement rocks relied on sparse, undated samples from the tiny number of drill holes shown here by the black circles, and as well as potential field data like the background magnetic image. In short, very little was known about basement geology beneath the Barclay Tablelands. However, in addition to the iron oxide alteration shown here, these historical drill holes intersect some pretty interesting rocks, including intermediate to felsic intrusives, scarn like alteration in carbonates, and low to medium grade sheared metapelites. These rocks demonstrate that this region experienced significant tectonic and magmatic activity. And in addition, they show that the rocks that experience this activity are preserved within about 100 to 200 metres of the surface across a relatively large region. Furthermore, as Catherine discussed previously, new geochronological data from the Exploring for the Future program demonstrates that basement sediments and volcanics from the East Tennant region, highlighted here in red, are age equivalent to mineralised rocks in Tennant Creek. What's more, we know that rocks from the East Tennant region experienced the same 1850MA deformation and mag um, magmatism that drove mineralisation in Tennant Creek, the Tennant event, and that the spatial expression of this event continues east of Tennant Creek along the corridor highlighted here, the same broader corridor that Anthony, Anthony introduced earlier. So to place this back into the mineral systems framework presented earlier by Anthony, this te tectonomagmatic event that drove copper gold mineralisation at Tennant Creek also affected rocks beneath East Tennant and could have provided the energy to drive a significant mineral system in the region. As Anthony mentioned, long period magnetotelluric data show a conductivity anomaly at depth consistent with the presence of a fertile source such as a metasomatised mantle. Additional data sets like the contours of lithospheric depth and near surface faults shown here indicate that the highlighted corridor preserves favourable tectonic architecture for tapping deep fertile source regions and bringing mineralisation up to the surface. Data sets like the broadband magnetotelluric survey show evidence for crustal scale alteration and transport of material into the upper crust. And finally, uh, data sets such as the magnetite hematite alteration modelling shown here show evidence for potential redox driven mineral deposition traps. And there are numerous other potential trap sites in the region, including structures, carbonates, and graphitic sediments. Also, rocks from the region show direct evidence of alteration that's comparable to other iron oxide copper gold deposits. So the real ele elephant in the room here is whether there's actually any, min any mineralisation preserved east of Tennant Creek under the Barclay Tablelands. But if we knew the answer to that, we wouldn't be doing this program. At the end of the day, Geoscience Australia's aim is not to find ore deposits, but to incentivise industry to efficiently explore for them. To bring it back to the haystack analogy, we've identified a pretty unloved haystack in the middle of nowhere that no one really knew existed. And we've convinced mineral explorers that this is actually a haystack worth exploring for needles in. And we've demonstrated some pretty powerful scale reduction tools for this exploration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy and Anthony. Wow. How much more do we know about that region now than we knew before? It's amazing. What you've heard so far is really the core of our business. It's rocks, it's expressions of the rocks and the geophysics and geochemistry. It's how to narrow in on that search space that way. But there's a certain elephant in the room here. 
We're doing this not to generate activity, not just to find out what is in Australia, down deep beneath cover. We're doing this because we care about discovery of new resources, which make a material difference for Australia and indeed the whole world. So a remaining question is, is any discovery in this new region economic? So to answer this question, what we've done is we've actually developed a new tool. And it's just one example of the toolbox. You've heard a few other examples of it, like, for example, eggs and so on. But here I just want to take one slide uh, to pause and tell you a little bit about this particular tool. So what it does is it looks at what is the economics of a mining activity anywhere across a region. It takes into consideration mining costs. And we've developed this in partnership with Monash University, like we've partnered with lots of different universities for various parts of this program. Now, normally what we're, we consider economics is once we've actually found a project and we've kind of got it to a place where we kind of want to see whether it's got legs, all right? And what we take into consideration is the cost of mining, be it open pit, underground, the distribution of energy or the supplies. Do you need to build your own power plant or can you hook into it? What royalty structures exist? What's the distance to the closest roads, uh, railways, ports? But the elephant room is what cost will it be to mine through that cover? So this map that I'm showing you here shows the uh, net present day value of a deposit which you can find in Tennant Creek. It's 4 million tonnes at about 2% copper and 3 grams per tonne gold. And we've made some assumptions on the value of those particular uh, metals uh, according to the London Metal Exchange. What you can see is that the region's in red, you'll make a profit. It's got a positive net present day value. The region's in blue, you'll be losing money. And the region in black is where you'll break even. What's important about this is that it shows that across this region, actually this deposit is economic. It's not a particularly big deposit, but it challenges the assumptions that if you found a deposit like this undercover, could you exploit it economically? And it does seem to indicate that you can. What you'll see in it is the dark red regions, they're the regions of our crop across the area. The area the, there's a big north-south boundary, that's a difference in royalties. There's a finer pattern in there, and that finer pattern is controlled by the cover distribution and distributions of, of transport infrastructure. Importantly, we can't just provide you one map to tell you what's economic. There are way too many variables to do that. So we've provided you a tool in the portal where you can select your size of the deposit, the grade, the tonnages, the, uh, your forecast of metal prices into the future, your net discount rates of your company, and things like that. So that you, it can guide you into the best area uh, selection. So that, you know, while we're all looking for the giants, we also want to be probably looking in areas where we, if we find a moderate deposit, it will be economic also. So it's a kind of a reality check, and it's also useful for governments in terms of if we put infrastructure in one area, what difference would that make to the minerals industry there? It can be used by investors to look at, well, if this project grows by another 50% as forecast, you know, what's the kind of back of the envelope NPV value? This is not a detailed tool, it's supposed to tell you about regions, but it does provide a first, first pass area selection. So that brings us to the end of the technical presentations. And I just want you to pause a moment and think about what you've heard. Uh, in a recent presentation, when we gave uh, this gamut of, uh, of talks uh, in, uh, in Adelaide to a, to a training centre, one prominent academic said to me, Carol, we've never seen anything like it. I don't think anybody's ever seen anything like it. And I think that's true. We're very proud of what we've been able to achieve in this program. And the message that we keep getting from industry is, wow, look at the diversity, the, uh, the in-depth knowledge, and the volume of information that you are providing. And what comes back is, how do we appropriate that? 
How do we take hold of it and make the most amount of use of it? So we realised fairly early on in the program that innovation, products and tools, they're not enough. What's important is actually having the discussion. So thank you for tuning in and listening into our conversation now. But uh, in order to transfer what we've learnt, we've had multiple workshops as part of the program. And the most recent one, unfortunately, was cancelled because of COVID. Now we plan to do more of these. Uh, maybe we'll do them online. The way that you can learn about what data sets that we're releasing and these various workshops is to sign up for the uh, Minerals Alert that we put out on a monthly basis. And the link is just here. So please stay tuned as we try and transfer more and more of this information and so that you can pick our brains and work out where the weaknesses are in the various arguments. But we also want to thank uh, the industry and academia and other geological surveys for guiding us as to what we have done as part of this program. So not only have we done workshops during the program, but there were workshops before which set out what are the high and highest priority areas to tackle? And that was the Uncover Roadmap, which was led by Myra. This is a snapshot of 16 of the high and highest priorities from that roadmap. The blue areas you can see are areas which were thought were important in terms of data compilation, data acquisition, research, technology development. And I've put little ticks into areas that we think we've made significant progress on. It's not to say that it is done. It's a big country, and in order to realise the full benefit of exploration and recover, we need to keep going. And we've also realised that, actually, there's a lot more to do on some of these cases. Like, let's take, for example, Osiray. Not only is it a data acquisition problem, but it's also a data compilation problem. It's research about how we uh, be able to generate products from it very quickly. And there's technology development associated with the inversions and the like. And all of this we've tried to incorporate as part of this program. And that's just one tiny example of those things. So what has this led to? Well, we would say it's led to quite a lot of impact. Um, personally, I haven't been part of a program which has realised so much change within the course of the actual program. Normally, we wait 10 or 20 years for industry to pick up ground to act on the things that we have done. What we've seen here is this is a map of that Tenning Creek to Manizer region where we've got 14 companies that have picked up ground for minerals and energy exploration. About 10 of, this, uh, 10 of these companies have gone on the record to say that it was the Exploring for the Future program, specifically the data sets and the insights that we've, uh, that we've generated, that led to the pickup of those tenements. And the area that has been picked up is phenomenal. It covers over 80,000 square kilometres. That's an area the size of Ireland in one program. That's phenomenal. So it probably poses the question, well, how do we get at those data sets which have enabled that type of ground tenement pickup and spurred on that type of exploration? Well, the data sets that we've discussed today are available through the portal. This is the link to it. There's a whole gamut of information there. Not only can you see things in 2D, linked to, to, to metadata behind it, but you can also see slices in 3D. And this is just a slap, snapshot of that marvellous OzIEM survey in 3D. But it doesn't happen alone. Richard's already pointed out the various collaborations that we've had in terms of institutions. I want to point out that there, behind those institutions is a wealth of individuals that we have collaborated with. This is a snapshot of the institutions and individuals uh, from outside of GA, and there's been a huge amount of people that have been backing us up at GA. And it's really together that we've been able to do this. So that's the end of our presentation. Now we would like you to join us for question time at this question time, you'll, the speakers will be there, but we're also going to have our experts who have generated the data sets and the insights that we have presented. So please come and join us and ask your questions. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Serkham. I'm the Program Coordinator for, for the Exploring for the Future program, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to the Q&A session for today's, today's Row Show. Um, I hope you found the presentation very informative. We've already had several questions uh, come in, and we'll start working those way th through those now. Um, if you see at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A box, you can click on that and bring that up, and you can type in your question and uh, we'll attempt to get to all the questions in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, but if, if we can't, uh, we will follow up directly with people um, as we go through. We have some of our uh, experts here today um, online ready to go asking questions. I've got uh, Richard Blewett, who's the branch head for Mineral Systems, Marie, uh, Marie Ord Bonanard, uh, who's the activity leader for National Geological Mapping, uh, Carol Sanoda, director of the Mineral Potential section, Wenping Jiang, the senior geophysicist at Modeler and uh, our MT expert, and Anthony Schofield, who's the activity leader for the East Tenant project. So the first question I will throw to Carol. We had a question about the, the bare earth. It was sort of a double barreled question about the bare earth um, map uh, the, from Sentinel-2. So the several questions here, but I'll, I'll lay it all out and Carol can answer those. Could you describe in more detail your Sentinel-2 bare earth compositional projects? Are there publications that describe this process? And also, is there a reason you use the Sentinel-2 imagery for your bare earth surface geology rather than the ASTA imagery? So over to you, to Carol. Uh, thank you, Keith. So uh, I'll start with the second one first. Uh, the uh, the reason why we, we've used Sentinel-2 as opposed to ASTA, which has many more bands and more applicable to, uh, to mineral exploration, is largely because you need multiple passes. And there are a few passes of the, Sentinel, uh, of the ASTA satellite. So we weren't able to strip away the clouds and have enough passes in order to find those barest earth pixels in a, in a concerted manner. So we have actually tried and we're able to do in a few places across Australia, but not a complete national coverage. Uh, in terms of what do we have that's, uh, that's able for, uh, that we can, um, uh, that we've released uh, and the methodology. So coming up with the barest model, there's a paper by Roberts, Wilford and Gatz uh, that was published in Nature Communications in 2019, uh, which lays out the, um, uh, the, the method of making up these barest earth products. What's important here is that they use novel mathematical high dimensional geometric means uh, to come up uh, with uh, the barest pixels and importantly they preserve the spectral integrity and hence ratios of the various spectral bands can be achieved. Now this wasn't uh, possible in the past and it's been possible because we've been able to team up with uh, Dar Roberts at the, at the ANU who's a statistician. There is a, a um, Exploring for the Future, Extended Abstracts, uh, a paper by John Wilford and uh, Dar Roberts on this, and it's looking at Landsat data. As you can see, I'm saying Landsat as opposed to Sentinel-2, and that's because we're still working on finalizing the Landsat, uh, the, the Sentinel-2 product uh, for, for release, but you can currently get your hands on uh, the Landsat imagery. Uh, it's probably the simplest way to do this is to get, get to that extended abstract and there are links from there to it or go onto the portal where a lot of the bands and the various ratios are preserved. And in the abstract itself, it also tells you what type of uh, ratios uh, can be used to map different geological mediums. Uh, over back to you, Keith. Thanks, Carol. Uh, the next question I have is um, for Marie Ord, which is um, related to the, I guess, the solid geology mapping. So for Marie Ord, how do we know what data points uh, you used in the interpretation of the solid geology? Over to you. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, it's, it's a very fair question. Um, this seamless solid geology was released with explanatory notes where the rationale for the interpretation was described in details. Uh, so this entire data set covers about 180 quarter million map sheets and about 100 of them uh, comes with interpretation notes. And this is mostly located in the Northern Territory and in Queensland. So for example, what you can access from this interpretation summary for every single chronostratigraphic layer, uh, you can get a list of some key boreholes that we use to do the interpretation. You can have a description of the magnetic character, for example, that we use to extend an outcrop under cover. 
And if the constraints were really limited, uh, you can also have access to a short description of the author regarding his reasoning and how he did this interpretation. So this uh, explanatory note, this document, uh, can be accessed through the extended abstract. You have a link to that, and it will be also posted on the portal, uh, on the GA portal. Uh, now, maybe something we can also mention about that. So despite our best effort to make this data set uh, as correct as possible, this is a very, very complex data set. Uh, and we can, of course, expect to have a few errors in this data set. So as we start using it, and if you come across any inconsistency, please reach out and provide us some feedback, because that will really help us to improve this unique data set. Yeah, back to you, Keith. Thank you, Marie Ord. Uh, the next question is for uh, Anthony Schofield. Um, it is around uh, what is the role of drilling undertaken by GA compared to mineral exploration drilling? Over to you, Anthony. Yep, great. Thanks for that, Keith. Um, so I guess even though the tools that we use are similar, uh, that being drilling, there's some important differences between uh, what we do and what industry does. So the drilling program that uh, will be run out of East Tenant, uh, like other drilling programs which are run by state and territory jurisdictions, is stratigraphic drilling. And what that means is, unlike mineral exploration drilling, which is trying to find an ore deposit uh, with economic minerals, uh, what we're drilling for is rocks, really. And that's to better understand the fundamental geological framework. Uh, we can then interpret this regional geological framework for what it means in terms of mineral prospectivity in the region. So to summarise it, I guess what we're trying to do is to reduce the technical exploration risk to mineral explorers by understanding what the basement rocks are, what the mineral systems they have potential for are, and how deep you have to go to get to those rocks. Over to you, Keith. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, the next question I have is to uh, Win Ping about the uh, the OSLAMP 3D model. So the question for Wenping is, uh, is the computational demand for running a 3D OSLAMP model very high? How long does it take? And how about a broadband model? Over to you, Wenping. Okay, Keith, thank you. Uh, yes, the, computation, the computational demand for running 3D OSLAMP models is very high. Uh, we use high performance computing facilities in NCI to run the OSLAMP TISA model. It still takes about one month. Um, for the broadband model, it's relatively smaller and it takes about four about three, four days to do one run. I hope I answered your question. Back to your case. Thank you, Wenping. Uh, the next question I have is for uh, Richard uh, around, uh, yes, the, I guess the fingers of God question. Uh, the fingers underneath IOCGs imaged via EMT are thought to follow fossilized fluid pathways, but are present at remarkable crustal depths much deeper than one would expect fluids to get. What is the postulated source of these fluids? Over to you, Richard. Mm, it's a really good question, and we ponder what the actual source of this anomalous conductivity is in both the crust and uh, into the upper mantle. It's something, particularly around IACGs, was first, I guess, beautifully illustrated by Graham Heinsen and his team around Olympic Dam, and this is where we first coined the, the notion of the fingers of God. And as we've successively rolled out our empty program, um, ourselves and our state partners and industry, we're starting to see more and more of these. And yes, indeed, they do come from, from great depths. And not just for IOCG systems. I also saw it with my first experience with MT was back in the early 2000s across the uh, East Yulgarn and seeing the Kalgoorlie terrain is, a, is an anomalously um, conductive region. So there's, it's telling us something about uh, fluid, fluid pathways. Uh, what the ultimate source of the, of the fluids is, I guess that's still a, a, a question we're, we're, we're trying to answer. Uh, but we certainly see empirically um, major deposits sitting on the edges of these deep conductors that go right down into the upper mantle. And as we do increasing infill data, like the broadband, you saw the broadband infill in the East Tenet area there, uh, we, we can see these things resolving off as, as these, these little fingers. Um, and Ernest Henry, we saw the example 
has an example again coming off that big concurry uh, conductor that's deep, and there's an ore body sitting on top of that. So we ask the question: Are they? Are these fingers? Are they all going to be prospective? We don't know. Obviously, you'd have to drill them. Um, we can also, as, you, as you've seen, as we go into AMT, audio magnetotelluric, and AEM really start to refine these 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 conductors. So I. Not sure I'm really answering the question about what the postulated source of these fluids, other than we know they're deep and they're involving the mantle, the upper mantle, and probably devolatilization of those mantle rocks. Um, I'll just hand over to Corolla though, if I can, because we do have a piece of work that we're doing with some some um, university partners and with some of our state um, ter and territory geological surveys. So Corolla, are you able to take the next bit of the question? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, look, uh, it, it's a great question. Um, it's we're all we're all intrigued um, exactly what it is. Uh, people at the moment have seen relationships associated with hydrous phases. So things like phlogopite. Uh, these could be a result of uh, either past subduction zones or, um, uh, or or small melt fractions moving up, and uh, and we can see relationships to other geological features uh, that have those types of signals. But really to narrow it down, what we want to be able to do is be able to constrain the composition of the uh, of the mantle and of the crust. And we can do this by bringing all of the controls that we have from the geophysics and also from samples down at those depths in terms of xenoliths xenol um, by mapping the thermochemical structure. So this is a linkage project uh, that we've got uh, going with uh, Klaus Regan Alib and with Juan Carlos Alfonso. And the idea here is to bring in probabilistic uh, MT inversion together with a, with a code called LithMod in order to be able to make those types of inferences and then also pose the question, are any of these uh, features that we see the result of present day deformation uh, in the crust because some of the work that Stefan Thiel has done has indicated that some of these conductors may well be related to the present day stress state of the Australian lithosphere and if that's the case then, we're, then maybe there'll be false positives that we're, we're kind of looking into the frozen in systems in the, in the hunt for giant deposits. Uh, so I might leave it at that and uh, I'll pass it over to, uh, uh, to Keith. Thank you, Carol. Um, actually, while you've got the floor, Carol, I can pass you back another question that's, that's come in. Um, I guess it's talking around the that general observation around uh, southeast northwest mineral trends. Um, it's obviously been long recognised in that North Australian zinc belt area, um, and now we can see that you know some of those trends obviously continue undercover. Um, I guess there's a general question about is that you know what are those trends are about what's what do you think um, causing that in that, in that sort of larger picture? Over you, over you to Carol. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Yeah, so uh, uh, the, 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 there were multiple um, back and forth on this question, and uh, and uh, and all of us also pointed out that um, uh, the, that maybe you know that the place uh, to look is under cover. And just one thing that I want to point out is that while we saw that there are trends in terms of the uh, in terms of distribution of the deposits that have this uh, northwest southeast orientation, uh, the surface geology did not show that trend in a convincing manner. So the, the geology of the surface uh, did not sweep around in a, in a northwest southeast trend. So it's the it's the cryptic evidence from the isotopes uh, from the geophysics. That we've been able to then infer where the uh, where these deposits sit. What's also really intriguing in terms of the link to the cover here is that uh, actually this uh, the contour that these deposits sit on this 170 kilometres of the of the of the lithospheric plate thickness to the east of it marks pretty much demarcates the uh, the extent of uh, the um, the Carpentaria and the, and the Aramanga basins, so the Cretaceous marine flooding of uh, uh, of Australia. So, uh, so uh, the, the deposits seem to be trusted at just on an interface. And where do we look next? Well, it's probably along this uh, the, this 170 kilometre contour. You can see it here in terms of this uh, this heat map. And indeed, data sets like this and this one have been used by companies to pick up new tenements in those regions. Uh, I might leave it there. Thank you, Carol. 
Uh, next question is uh, back to Wen Ping as well. Um, I guess a bit more question about the uh, the modelling side of things. Um, what do you think about uh, the uncertainty in the in the models, and I guess how you visualise that and capture that in in those three D models? Um, over to you, Wen Ping. Thank you, Keith. Um, yes, in terms of model uncertainty, uh, on one hand, when we were producing models, we tried to reduce uncertainty by running a range of models with different sub data set and different um, parameter combinations. Then, if possible, for 1D model, we have implemented probabilistic modeling approach, which is to sample millions models, then can quantify the uncertainty in the models. But for 2D and 3D models, the computational demand would be extremely high. Uh, we haven't implemented yet. So to produce a single preferred model, we still start with a range of models from um, the, com the parameter computation and the sub data sets. Then, when we in interpret the model results, we would um, work with geologists and other geophysicists to consider the data in, in, in data integration with other geophysical data sets and known geology uh, geology uh, knowledge to interpret the model results, then increase the confidence in the models. Yeah, back to you, Keith. Thank you, Wenping. Uh, next question I'll, I'll throw to Richard, because it's a bit of a, a bit more of a strategic level question, and you know, what would you do <laughs> type question. Uh, so, Obviously, yes, we've sort of reached the end of phase one of the program. Um, if we were starting over, or were we starting again, I guess, with the new phase of the Exploring for the Future, what might you do or have done differently? Um, are there particular data sets, analyses, et cetera, that you might have collected more of or plan to collect more of, I guess, depending on which tense you go with? Over to you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you, and um, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, hindsight is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and it's really interesting, sort of sitting back here, looking at uh, with great pride of what we've achieved, and um, I, look, I, I'm delighted with what we've been able to achieve. You know, when I wrote the new policy proposal and put the pitch into government back in 2015 to to get this program up, um, little did I um, think that we would actually achieve as much as we have ha have achieved. So uh, it's been a remarkable program. I'm very proud of the team. What, we, what we've been able to do and what we've been able to learn from that. So part of the, the lessons is, I guess, getting together earlier and planning planning better, so making sure that we, we integrate better. We've, we've done a remarkable job of integrating and we're looking as we go forward uh, to continue to do that and build on that, that knowledge, uh, build on all those tools that we've um, built as well and uh, continue to sort of add value and integrate all those wonderful data sets. All those data sets have been Incredible! You saw the, all the different layers we've got from the surface all the way through into the bottom of the lithospheric mantle. I guess this is perhaps more of a personal personal um, favourite was the passive seismic. Um, yeah, that was a high risk uh, thing to do. You know, it was outlined in the uncover roadmap, and I just thought this is a this is a chance to actually really take take this on and um, build on the remarkable work that's happened in the academic area, particularly the Research School of Earth Sciences and really apply it to um, a mineral systems problem. And I, it's um, revealed a remarkable number of new insights that we hitherto would not have had uh, and just reinforced the, the, the power of the other data sets. So I'd say passive seismic would be um, one of those, I guess, favorites that, that, that have come out of the, the mix, but they're, they're all needed. Uh, to tackle this undercover problem, we need pretty much the, the full um, alphabet. Um, so it's hard to pick a favorite. Thanks, uh, Keith. Over to you. Thanks, Richard. Very good. Uh, we have a question, I guess, and I'll, I'll put this to Anthony because um, it relates to the East Tenant area. Uh, which among the tenements pegged along the postulated East Tenant Fairway are getting positive exploration results? Over to you, Anthony. Yep, thanks for that, Keith. Um, look, I think the thing to note about the East Tenant Corridor is that it's a newly emerging exploration frontier. So um, 
a lot of the tenements that were shown in, in the presentation today uh, have been really recently taken up. So um, uh, previously, a lot of that area was under a no application allowed status. Um, and that was to give us room to uh, do our EFTF work uh, in conjunction with the Northern Territory Geological Survey in the area. Um, and then uh, last year, um, towards the, uh, the end of last year, we, we um, showed our results to industry and uh, coming out of that, a number of explorers decided to take up tenements in the region. So uh, those tenements that have been pegged along uh, the East Tenant Corridor there are quite new ones, um, but, and so there's not a lot of exploration results there, but it's gonna be quite interesting and exciting to see what emerges out of there in the coming years. Uh, there has been some previous exploration in the area, not very much, um, and a lot of that exploration was looking for uh, things like diamonds or sediment hosted base metals, which, um, you know, we think there's there's uh, potential for uh, larger mineral systems than than some of those in the region. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty underexplored area, so it'll be good to see what's coming up. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, next question is uh, back to Carole about the um, the economic fairways tool. Um, so. Does the economic fairways tool comprise an estimate of ore body geometry and orientation? Uh, this obviously determines the mining method selection and cost associated and you know can be the difference between ten dollars a ton and a hundred dollars a ton. Uh, over to you, Carol. Yeah, thank you, Keith. That's an excellent question. Uh, yes, it does. So uh, in the in the tool on the right hand side of the portal, there is a component there which is the geometry, where you select the dip and the thickness of the uh, of the ore body. Um, there, we kind of use scaling models in terms of um, the uh, these uh, uh, the dimensions of the of the ore body, and importantly, the uh, the economics are based on published costs of uh, of companies over the last few years. They're now back on 2000 and 18, I think, costs in terms of re reported materials. Uh, the publication on this is by Walsh, Northey, Houston, Yelichetti, and, and Charnota. Uh, it's in Resources Policy and it came out into 2020. There is also a Exploring for the Future Extended Abstract uh, by Marcus Haynes and others uh, under the um, Mineral System uh, Systems themes. Uh, where you can find links and, uh, and the full references uh, to these uh, publications. So uh, we're also, um, uh, the code is also open source, so we're happy to share it uh, with, uh, with anybody who is, uh, who is interested. And uh, yeah, so uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, oh yeah, I, I one more thing. Uh, the model automatically transitions from the cheapest mode of mining. So, if uh, the, 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 there are different costs of mining as, the, as, uh, as you go deeper and deeper, uh, there is a particular transition point from open pit to underground, and the model just chooses the, the, uh, the cheapest cost all the way through uh, the, the various decision paths, including different types of mining, uh, underground mining methods. So, whether you're block caving or stoping, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so, I might leave it at that. Keith, back to you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I've got another question, or a couple of questions actually. Uh, I guess I will pass to Richard because I guess they're, they're sort of the big questions about, okay, what comes next? So there's a few questions along those lines. What's the next steps for EFTF, the extension, and when is EFTF coming to my neighborhood? Is basically the, the theme of those questions. So over to you, Richard. Yes, so I uh, hope you've all heard that uh, Geoscience Australia has been um, fortunate to have been provided another $125 million for four years to expand and extend the Exploring for the Future program. Uh, the expansion and extension is, includes all of onshore Australia. So yes, we're coming down to New South Wales, South Australia. We did have some work in South Australia actually as part of the program, but we didn't talk about it in here. So we drilled the Campana with our colleagues in the Geological Survey of South Australia. So we have dipped our toes in South Australia and exploring for the future phase one, um, but we are coming south and down into Victoria and Tasmania, as well as the southern parts of WA. We will continue to work in the north as well. So it's very much a, a whole of country, whole of continent uh, treatment, at least onshore. It will have a focus of minerals, energy, and groundwater. So we're really going to look to build on the uh, integration. So we collect a, a piece of data. We think about 
uh, how it can inform on all the all the um, the three themes: minerals, energy, and groundwater. And our energy and our groundwater colleagues are thinking the same. So it's a, a large team that's going to be working on this. It's pretty much the entire um, minerals, energy, and groundwater division. Funnily enough, that's what we're called. Um, and uh, we, it'll be a, a real um, powerful team to, to work on all of Australia and its resource potential. I think that's probably enough from me on what's next. Thank you. Over to you, Keith. Thank you, Richard. Yes, I would, exciting times are here, definitely. Um, and there'll be, there'll be we'll put in a bit of a plug that there'll probably be a bit more discussion about that at the Friday um, discussion panel session as well. So if you haven't already registered, do that as well. Um, Sorry, Richard, just, yep. Yeah, I'll just sort of remind people that there are um, seminars like this tomorrow um, for, for uh, energy and also groundwater and then the, the panel session. So if you want to hear more about uh, what the program's been doing, uh, then please sign up. Thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, we're down to uh, five minutes to go. We've still got a few more questions we'll, we'll try to get in in the next few minutes. Uh, I've got another one that I'll pass um, back to Anthony, um, which is around uh, what, are, um, what analyses are we likely to undertake on the East Tenant uh, Stratigraphic Drill Core? Anthony. Yep, so the short answer to that is a whole lot. Um, and that's because we want to make sure that we uh, fully characterise the nature of what these rocks are. So we want to be able to understand their composition. So we're going to do things like um, mineralogy and, and whole rock geochemistry and isotopes. Um, we want to know how old they are. Um, so we'll do plenty of geochron. Um, and you know we're, we're trying to understand their, their geophysical properties as well. So um, getting a lot of petrophysics on these rocks. So yeah, basically just trying to um, acquire the kind of data that's been shown um, throughout the course of these presentations uh, that we can we can use to to characterise these rocks and and try and understand how they got there, you know, what they look like geophysically, things like that. Um, but one of the nice things that's uh, going to be a part of this drilling program is that it's being done as part of the MINEX CRC, and what that does is it enables us to get access to a whole range of researchers which are associated with, with the CRC. Um, and they've got all sorts of fancy bits of, uh, of lab kit and, and different analyses and things like that they can, they can do on the, on the drill core. Um, I can't go through all of them now, but there's a lot of extra value to be gained through that. So um, at the end of the program, they'll be very well characterized rocks. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, well, one one more question here that I'll, I'll pass to Carol. So it's um, going back to the LAB, uh, the uh, Lithosinosphere Boundary Study, and so it's asking: Does the 170-kilometer uh, level have geological significance, or is it picked on correlation with deposits? Uh, over to you, Carol. Uh, yep. So the 170 kilometers is the best fit to the deposits uh, globally and in Australia. Uh, it's, uh, it may well be different if you choose to use a different uh, lithosphere sinosphere boundary model. So our one is derived from a conversion from um, velocities from tomography converted to temperature uh, using analysticity parameterizations which have been calibrated on xenoliths or the plate model. Um, and in terms of its geological significance, um, We've chosen to parameterize it this way uh, because of the way that um, it fits anisotropic data also within uh, within the Earth. But in terms of it's at the moment a sheer um, empirical observation, and there are implications for the thermal structure of basins which are formed above it. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we'll take. We've got uh, one more question here that. Uh, I will pass um, back to Richard as well. Uh, so this is a question, I guess, a broader question, but a sort of society question about overall social license. And I guess, uh, what are the, some, some of the lessons learned, uh, learned along the way as part of the program that we think um, would be beneficial in sharing with a, a wider audience and industry and uh, government and community? Um, Richard, do you have any, any comments about what we've learned along the way on social license matters? Yes, look, thank you for the question and it's absolutely vital. Um, we have a big footprint um, obviously across where, we, where we're working and one of the challenges has been not tripping over ourselves. Um, so it's, 
important that we communicate internally and with our, um, our state and territory geological survey partners, but more importantly that we communicate with our, uh, the landowners and the land councils and the councils and, and basically anybody who's got an interest in land. So it's really important that we communicate, 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 and that we're very open and transparent that the data sets that we collect benefit everybody. So one of the reasons and the rationales behind the portal was providing all these data for everybody so that they can make informed decisions about uh, who, who's uh, able to, I guess, enter or, or come onto land or develop land ultimately. So it's, it's the, the baseline information we collect is really important. The water information we collect obviously is important, but people are also interested in the science of what we're doing. Uh, so we, we very much work on um, providing this in, in um, more accessible area, ways so that um, people can understand what, what, we've, what we're achieving through fact sheets and things like that. So these are all very important parts of, of, of what, we, what we do. And at Geoscience Australia, we've set up a, a specialised team um, called Land, Land Access and Marine, Marine, Marine Engagement, LAMA, no, LAMA, anyway, the LAMA team. And uh, they support all of our work, but also all of the work of Geoscience Australia. So it's not just um, what uh, the geoscientists are doing. We all have positioning people working all over Australia as well. So we, li we link up uh, in multiple ways. All the satellite feeds that come out from, from Geoscience Australia's work, which feeds into uh, the wonderful maps you saw, again, they're provided. So it's, a, it's, a very, it's much a, a whole of agency approach to, to, la to land access and social license. So I think that's, uh, there's also a, uh, a, an abstract on our social uh, engagement work as well, which I'd encourage you to, to look at. Thank you. Over to you, Keith. Thank you, Richard. And that's a yeah, good, good place to finish up. We're, we're just on time, so um, I'll wrap it up here and thank everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being part of the event today and uh, tuning in and registering and um, being part of it all. Uh, I hope you all agree it's been a fascinating journey from the surface to the mantle and everything in between, and, and I hope you've taken away some key information that will help your work. Um, uh, we'll follow up in person uh, with uh, any questions that we didn't get to uh, today and um, please get in touch if you think of any new questions um, uh, later and uh, the, the uh, presentation and then it's full will be available on demand afterwards and you should get a, an email message to, um, to remind you about that so please um, if you want to follow up uh, feel free to do so. Um, and as Richard said, if you haven't already, please register for the next roadshows about the energy and groundwater research in Northern Australia, which are on tomorrow and Thursday at this time. Um, and then obviously the, the final the exciting discussion panel on Friday, which we're very much looking forward to because that'll talk a lot about what the next steps are and how we build on, on the great work of EFTF to create a better picture of Australian minerals, energy and groundwater resources right across the whole continent. Um, a registration link should be available in your browser window. So finally, thank you for joining us and from all of us here in Geoscience Australia, have a good afternoon. Goodbye.